Time is kind of tight, so I thought I would start with a, a bit of cloud magic. Um, you are all developers, and as developers, you care about apps, and as a speaker, I care about slides. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. So you care about your app. And uh, in the good old days, that was an easy proposition. You sat down, you wrote the app, you ran the app, you knew the app was good. But today, things are getting more complicated. It's a Node.js app, which you want to scale out, because that's the point. You're doing a bit of service-oriented architecture. So you've got two apps. One's kind of old school on Tomcat. That's got MySQL. The other one's Cassandra. Both of them sending trick tails, click, click trails to Hadoop. And you want to scale the whole lot out, because that's the point. And as a developer, there's this huge gap between the experience that you have writing your app and the, the, the complex topology that's going to be running in production. Or is there? So we looked at how people were using Ubuntu on Amazon and tried to figure out if we could encapsulate all the goodness in each of those boxes so that they could become completely reusable. Um, and that is what Juju is all about. So Juju sets out to essentially distill the goodness in all of those boxes so that you can just reuse them immediately. And you can reuse them on your laptop, creating a complete environment, a complete mirror scaled out of what's going to be running in the cloud. Um, so this creates all kinds of possibilities. This, this is an example of how you'd use Juju. So I'm going to create a little service. Um, it's a Node.js service. I'm going to use something called Subway, which is, uh, which is a great little IRC client, HTML5 IRC client. It uses Mongo as a, as a, as a um, data store. So what's going on here? All we're doing is we're, we're deploying Mongo. Um, we are then deploying Node and telling it through some config that we wanted to pull in an app and then telling it that we want to call that node uh, in the graph subway. Uh, and then we're connecting um, all of those pieces. So we use Juju charms. Now, a charm is just a distillation of ops goodness. Uh, we have packages for binaries, and we have charms for all of the operational goodness that goes into that. Um, so I'm deploying the Mongo charm. Then I'm deploying the node app charm and telling it I'm going to call it Subway. Um, and then I'm going to deploy, and then I'm going to tell those two to connect to each other. And that's literally all I have to do. So um, what would it look like? Well, I have it running over here. Um, if I just do that, you can see that on, in memory, I have a bunch of different containers. We've done a lot of works on, work on Linux containers. So in memory, I have a bunch of different, almost like virtual machines, but much more lightweight. And you can see that they have different IP addresses. They're all connected up. Um, the sum total of the work to create that is, is what I showed you. Um, and you can see down here that, uh, that Subway itself has got its own IP address. So I can go and have a look at that. Um, well, it's already there. And I know it's on port 3000. Well, yeah, life. And so, uh, and so there it is running. So that's running live in memory. I can scale it out. I can um, add units to it. So for example, if I wanted to, to tell that Mongo charm that I wanted to scale it out, I could say something like juju add unit. Uh, whoops. Um, to. And I think that would give me a little bit of happiness. Um, I can also visualize this. So um, uh, this is a little command that will show you essentially what's running um, in, a nice, in a nice kind of environment. OK. So uh, let's just kill that. So development's about iterations, right? There's iterations on your desktop. Then there's iterations in tests. And now suddenly you have handovers as well. Um, and ultimately, iterations all the way through to production. And we measure velocity by saying, how fast can you get from development of a new feature so you're happy with it, till testing is happy with it, till production is happy with it. And Juju is all about dramatically, radically, by an order of magnitude, cutting the friction 
um, and therefore increasing the velocity, reducing the time that it takes you to iterate in development, iterate through test, and iterate into production. And the interesting thing is that um, each of those things happens in a different place. So we had to make Juju so that you could deploy in memory on your laptop, but you could also deploy to the cloud, and you can deploy to the metal. So you can, you can design this complex topology, that whiteboard in your office, and you can run it in your laptop and then map it to any of those environments, right? So that's why we call Juju DevOps Distilled, because it really gets to the essence of what's going on in DevOps. Um, inside the charm, uh, all, of the, all of the wisdom of the expert who knows how to deploy Hadoop or deploy Cassandra is encapsulated. Um, what's happened here is that we've stepped up a level from configuration management. Um, people have preferences around configuration management. Juju can wrap around any of those. So um, inside that charm, you have to know and express when you're deploying Hadoop um, how, to, how to configure it the first time, how to configure replica sets, masters, and slaves, and so on. Um, you you might like doing that with Puppet, or you might like doing that with Chef, or you might like write, rewriting the configuration files with Perl or Orc or Sed, or however you choose to do it. That's okay. Juju just wraps that goodness essentially into the charm and encapsulates it so that you can reuse it so that other people can reuse it as well. Um, and that reuse is at a level that we've never seen before. So instead of Googling around and copying snippets of bash scripts that, that bring stuff up quickly, you're actually able to just reach into the cloud and grab an off-the-shelf charm that does most of what you're likely to want from any one of these kinds of things. There's hundreds of them now, um, and there's a whole community process that's sp spun up around it to, to, to improve the quality quality of those to, to give them to, to, for example, build test suites into the charms so that uh, um, they can be tested, to build benchmarks into the charms so that we know how they're improving over time. So go and have a look at jujucharms.com. There's tons of charms there. Um, there's a level of abstraction that's going on. We are um, getting rid of the day where you actually need to know all of the configuration details of some of these complex parts, um, because the charm writer will essentially decide that there are a couple of key choices that you have to make. For example, are you, are you wanting to optimize to run that in memory? Are you op optimizing that data store for write throughput? Are you op optimizing it for read throughput? And then inside the charm, they'll do all the work, essentially, to take that high-level choice, which is expressed as a property in the service once you've deployed it, um, to take that high-level level choice and map it into the configuration files that you need. So um, what you really want is you want to use the charm that was written by the guy who wrote the book with the animal on it, right? All of that wisdom distilled down into something that you can just deploy. Deploy Tarsus or uh, deploy the elephant. Um, Good charms today are starting to do some amazing things. For example, they will let you, as a property, they will let you say where the binaries should come from. So for example, you can d deploy a media wiki, which is a big complex bear of an application when you scale it out. And then you can go onto the, the media, wi media wiki uh, node in the graph, which might be scaled out to, to 10 units or 20 units. And you can say, look, I actually want to see how this is running with tip. And so changing one property in the charm deployment, which you can do in real time, essentially runs out to version control, pulls down the latest version of media wiki, does whatever needs to be done in terms of compilation, puts it in the right place, restarts it. You hit refresh in your browser. And, and your entire infrastructure just moved from uh, the stable package to, to tip. So it's an awesome kind of environment. You can, you, can, you can hack on branches, push those to GitHub, pull those into live running servers. Um, and Juju takes care of all of the complex orchestration, all of the sequencing of who needs to be notified of what change when something's scaling up, when something's scaling down. Um, we're essentially crowdsourcing ops, and that's not something that we've ever done before. We've, we've learned over the years to crowdsource development, um, and we've, we've got all the tools to do that. But for the first time, we're really starting to crowdsource in a really reusable way operational expertise. Obviously, this was born in the cloud. Um, that automation, that reuse um, uh, is, is, is kind of critical to the cloud, but it also has a huge impact on um, the internal development process. It's much easier to do continuous integration if you, if you essentially have um, very easily at your fingertips a complete de deployment environment, or if you can just keep that running in memory on the side. Um, we've seen people bind mounting their, their um, uh, code trees into running memory models um, and setting it up so that every time they save a file, the test suites just start running. So really cool stuff. It really changes the way you're able to deploy.
Uh, you can deploy to any infrastructure as a service. This is a little optimistic because Windows Azure is still uh, under development, but Windows Azure is coming. So <clears throat> the goal is to hit any infrastructure as a service. You should be able to take that model, um, draw it on the whiteboard, uh, create it in your laptop, add the parts that are special to you, throw it then to any cloud infrastructure, and of course, to the metal, and in that case, any architecture. You may have seen the announcement of uh, OpenStack on Ubuntu um, being spun up on ARM servers provided by Calzada as part of the TriStack initiative. That was all built, spun up with Juju talking to a provisioning server called Maz, Metal as a Service, that essentially allows you to take Juju charms and, and deploy them on physical metal. Uh, so we use that for, for bringing up OpenStack Stack really fast. Um, we showed uh, uh, bringing up an OpenStack cluster in sort of 15 minutes at the OpenStack Design Summit with it. Um, but scaling out Hadoop on the metal, any kind of big data, any sort of uh, uh, rapid deployment where you want to, to to bring stuff up quickly and then and then move it around, add to it, subtract from it, um, reconfigure it. Um, the story here is really about um, the full life cycle of the platform. Um, we want people to be able to use this from anywhere. So it's been ported to all of the Linuxes, um, Debian, Mac OS X. There's a Windows port in the works as well, as well. So you'll be able to do this from any environment whatsoever, address any cloud, um, uh, work on any platform. So the full story here is that it's not just about deployment. I mean, you can find a shell script which will deploy Hadoop really quickly for you at scale. Um, but, but the question then comes, how do you use that? How do you scale it up and scale it down? As these infrastructures live in the cloud, they become like gardens, and we have to prune them. We have to weed them. You might want to connect Nagios to a bunch of stuff, and then later on you might decide, no, strip out Nagios and, and, and use New Relic. Um, and that is really easy in a world where you actually have a, a graph that you can work on and tools that are designed to plug it together in that way. So where you really feel the, the benefit is when you've got stuff in production, you want to move it around. Um, there is a, there's a whole category of things that change. Um, Behavior-driven development is a very hot topic. It started as sort of test-driven development, but the, 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 the more deep-rooted thing is how do you coach yourself to work in a way which converges on quality or converges on, on, on velocity? Um, and this kind of tool, people who are into behavior-driven development really love it. Uh, Model-driven deployment is another kind of buzzword. The idea is that you say, look, that's what we're trying to achieve, and let the tools achieve that goal for you, rather than you having to poke around. Um, lots of people talk about AMI soup, um, this idea that you've got tons and tons of AMIs of, of unknown provenance, um, changing in versions, different security status uh, uh, positions. Um, again, Juju makes this a lot easier because you can, you, 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 the, the, the deployment process is entirely transparent. It's source code. Um, it's open source code. So you can, you can essentially see, right, this is how they got from a standard Ubuntu base image or CentOS base image, whatever you want, um, to that ultimate working unit, essentially, in the deployment. And it lets you do some things that we've kind of dreamed of for a long time. So right now, for example, I have that same, I have that same set of things running um, in, in um, EC2. So if I just go and take a look at this, uh, I can do, let me just check that it's still running. So this is not going out to EC2, taking a look at the, at the infrastructure over there. It'll come back and tell me what's running in EC2 in a second. Um, and there you go, it looks very, very similar, very familiar. Um, I have an empty space um, over at HP. HP just brought up a great um, OpenStack cloud, um, really, really fast. It's good fun to use, and uh, Juju talks to it. So um, that's an empty environment, essentially. Now, imagine that I could essentially just map what was running in EC2 to what was running in um, in HP. Well, in a Unixy kind of world, that would look something like this, right? We'd, we'd, we'd say um, cat file one to file two. Um, and instead, we can actually say that as something a bit like this, right? So Juju export production, um, and then import it on the other side into HP, um, in, into the HP environment that I created. So I'm going to do that. Now, before I do that, I'm actually just going to um, Go and have a look and, and just visualize what's going on. It helps to see. I think that will do the trick. 
So this will give me a visualization of that, of that environment. You can see that there's, there's not a lot happening there right now on HP, um, but if I, if I go and uh, uh, map that over, Right, so what I'm doing is, I've got stuff running in production in EC2. I saw on the weather report that there's this uh, scary thing called a direct show headed straight for the data, data center. And so with one command, I'm essentially going and fetching all of that production infrastructure and mapping it over to, um, to HP. And if I take a look at the visualization, you'll see that stuff flowing in now. So in sort of real time, we've mapped running infrastructure from uh, one cloud out there in the sky to a completely different cloud on a completely different platform, a completely different technology, and a completely different company, which is pretty cool. So four years ago, we set a challenge for Ubuntu, and we said, OK, we, we, we want to get into design. We want to bring design to open source. Um, we want to really sh focus on the user experience, and we want to innovate. We want to see if we can get ahead of Apple, get ahead of Microsoft. This is a time of profound change. We should, um, we should take the initiative and lead. And it turns out London is a fantastic place to hire designers. Um, they are, they are an, an awesome crowd. Um, they have their own language, but it's a language of real precision and rigor. Um, and I love this, this, this statement here. This is talking about unity and a composition. And if you read it, you'll see it's talking about it, very mathematical, very precise, measurable kinds of concepts. And it's talking about the balance between form and function, the idea that everything should, um, should have a purpose and should reflect its purpose. So we hired this team, and we set them uh, a slightly radical goal at the time. We said, we, we, we have this desktop, and it's a very popular desktop. Lots of people love it. Um, but we, want, we, we believe that the future looks like this diverse collection of form factors. So we want to have um, a user experience that spans a range of form factors, a desktop, but also a tablet and a phone. And in fact, um, we want a TV as well. Um, and so clearly, those are all different form factors with different constraints. They, they need different interfaces. But they can be, we believe, part of one family. It was very controversial at the time. And what was even more controversial is that we realized, as we, as we went through this process, we realized how all the pieces need to fit together if you went through this process of, of sort of deduction and, and inspiration, um, uh, that we were going to have to move our desktop around a lot. Um, and the reason was because if you tried to stick with the old desktop, then it would force your tablet and phone into all kinds of crazy postures. So we said, screw it. We're going to move the desktop to where it needs to be for the future. And that turned out to be quite a deeply unpopular process. Um, but we did something interesting. Every, every week, we, we would get in a bunch of people. They might be experts. We spent an amazing afternoon with Don Knuth, um, who has a completely hacked up, customized, personalized Ubuntu desktop environment just sort of suited for him. But we realized that a lot of the things that he was expressing and other people who like deep, deep, deep into code, um, they're all looking for similar things, right? How much real estate do I have? How much space do I have? How easy is it to move? How easy it for, is it for me to understand where I'm at? And we found that um, beginners wanted similar sorts of things. Um, nevertheless, there's some sort of severe tension. On the one hand, we wanted things really easy. On the other hand, we wanted things really hard. Um, and um, every week, we would bring people in to benchmark how we're doing. Um, when we started this process, we realized very quickly that the desktop that we had four years ago sucked. It was great for us. We all loved it. But if you put it down in front of anybody off the street, it was terrible. Today, we're in an interesting position. If you know Windows and you're confronted with a new desktop, Windows is the easiest. Ubuntu is the second easiest, and then Mac OS. And if you know Mac OS, then it's easier to switch to Ubuntu than it is to switch to, to Windows. So here we are in this interesting position. We have this UX that's, that's um, um, really proving itself in the laboratory. I mean, people actually respond to it. They want to take the CDs home. They want to get it. Um, uh, companies, Asus, HP, Lenovo, Dell, are shipping it um, in volume. Next year, 5% of the world's PCs will ship with Ubuntu pre-installed, which is kind of amazing. Um, and Asus ran an experiment where they shipped half a million of them to Germany, not 
not a, a, an easy market. And the return rates on Ubuntu were exactly the same as the return rates on Windows, which is the key indicator for OEMs who are looking to do this. Um, we had to move our desktop, because if we didn't, we'd end up where Windows 8 is, right? Where you have this shiny tablet interface, and you sit down, and you use it, and, and then you press the wrong button, and it slaps you in the face, and suddenly Windows 7 is back, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> And then you think, okay, this is familiar, and you're kind of getting into it. Whack! Oh, <laughs> wrong side of the face. And <laughs> and and so so we had to to move the desktop around. But now that we are, we're in this great position um, to to spread out across all of the form factors. So what did we what did we build? Well, um, uh, you may have seen it, um, but we cleaned the whole thing up. Um, a lot of it is sort of familiar. We we did some really interesting things. For example, apps have access to. Um, the indicators now. So, for example, the music player can embed itself in here. I can just get some music going over here. Um, messaging apps can come in here. So your, your mail client, IRC client and things can just sort of embed themselves in here. Those of you who stuck on Mac OS X will have to wait another couple of weeks for this feature. Um, we've had it for two or three years. Um, so what's the next challenge for us? Um, well, we've got this fantastic search environment that we, that we built, which gives me all of my files and so on. Hold on a sec, let's just, let's just ease up on that. Um, so this is a sort of search environment that gives me instant access to all of my apps, all of my files, and so on. Um, it's pretty cool. If I, if I want to watch a movie, I can go see what's out there. And we can find oh, a bunch of Harry Potter on Amazon. Um, uh, bits and bobs, um, and we did this cool thing called the, the HUD, which is sort of a reinvention of um, what menus want to be. So for example, I can go in here. Um, this is the GIMP, which you may be familiar with. Um, let me just make a new file. And then, so there's a bunch of menus up here, lots and lots and lots of stuff. But say, for example, I just wanted to add some transparency. Um, there we go, layer transparency, add alpha channel, great. Voila. So we made a super productive interface to, to menus, and uh, people love it. And this is just the, the first version, but as we, as we roll it out, it's, uh, it's, it's getting really colorful um, in the labs, and uh, 1210 is going to be awesome. Um, so, so the desktop is really shaped up. We've leapt ahead of many of the competition in, in interesting ways, um, but there's still sort of some core things for us to do. Um, and one of the biggest of those, I think, is, is figuring out how we're going to embrace the web. Um, uh, let me skip over this. The story here is this font that we built is kind of amazing. Every, every line there has a, a precise mathematical formulation. And, um, and in the tablet interface, the theme for the tablet interface, every visual element um, echoes the mathematics of that font in a very precise way. So it, it gives the whole thing this fantastic um, cohesion. Oh, yes, I, I need to tell you. Um, you may have seen the announcement, but Dell is going to start pre-installing Ubuntu in the North American market on this very beautiful laptop. Laptop, um, as part of Project Sputnik. So I want to thank the guys at Dell for leaping forward uh, and bringing <laughs> Linux. <laughs> bringing Linux back not on the low end, uh, the, what we affectionately call the crap tops, but on the high end, <laughs> Ultrabooks. Um, uh, beauty, the, the Dell guys talk about Beauty and the Beast, their top two developer environments. And we believe both of those will ship with Ubuntu as an option. You'll be able to choose on Dell.com, Windows, or Ubuntu. It's going to be great. Um, they're also going to take Ubuntu into retail. So this is happening now in China. You can go into a store and you'll see retail stuff. Electronic Arts has started pushing games to Ubuntu. And Valve have said that they're going to port Steam. Um, I know that we're all about the serious business of development, but Everybody's got to blow off a little steam. So what's next? Well, we want to embrace the web, and we want to make the web a first-class citizen on the desktop. We have this fantastic desktop. It's more productive than anything you could do if you were limited just to a browser. Um, but we still want to mash up the web and the desktop and make it like an amazing environment. So what would that look like? Well, if the web was a first-class desktop, then I could have an application like Gmail. So let's have OK. Um, and if it was a first-class application, then uh, so we've got some nice multi-touch stuff going on over here. Um, uh, if it was a first-class application, it would show up not in the browser, not trapped in the browser, but down here like this on this uh, on this launcher. Um, there it is. Um, and uh, if if it was if if it was a really cool environment, I could do sort of example last FM. 
as an application. And again, that would show itself up in the launcher. I could go in here, get a little bit of this going on. They're probably going to play me an ad, so I'm going to mute myself. I'm just going to go mute like that. And I just muted the environment. I love the HUD. It's amazing. So um, ooh, let's see. Uh, maybe I just need to. How do I love the Bieber? Bieber? Anybody? No, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, let's try this. Let's see if this works. Right, it is playing an ad. So let's go to Gmail. Well, again, if it was a first class app, we have this amazing HUD thing, right? So, or, go away. Um, they have this amazing HUD thing. So it wouldn't be cool if web apps could express themselves into the HUD too. So they could just skip that whole menus thing. Um, so I'd want to be, do something like this compose email, and voila, there we go. So, just so you understand what that is. That is a website that is putting itself in the launcher. Um, if I have a new, new message from Gmail, it shows up here. Um, there's Gmail over there. Um, I, can, I can use it like an application. I don't need menus. I have the HUD so the web app can express itself fully into the shell, um, be completely environment. I am officially professionally out of time, but I hope you have a fantastic conference. Thanks very much, and uh, enjoy 1210. It's going to be awesome. <laughs>